Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Be someone who cultivates a love for God's Word. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So this morning's message is entitled, Found Faithful, and it is all about the book of Job. Now, Job is a book which not many people speak about, and when people consider the book of Job, they think of a book of suffering. And so I believe the Lord wants to share with us out of the book of Job today And I trust and I know that the Lord wants to sow a seed of encouragement and hope into your heart today. 
But just by way of introduction, there is a word that is being used quite a bit lately. And it is the word unprecedented. Think about how often you've heard this word being spoken over the last few weeks. Many times, especially in news broadcasts, uh, short video, YouTube clips, everybody is talking about an unprecedented time that we are living in right now. While the word unprecedented means never done or known before. Let that settle in your heart for a moment. Never done or known before is the meaning of unprecedented. You know, that word is not a word that can be used in the context of our God. Think about that for a moment. Where would you use the word unprecedented in the context of our God? You see, because our God is the all-knowing one. Our God is the Alpha and the Omega, and He knows the beginning from the end. So, child, will you today receive great comfort in the knowledge that nothing that is going on in the world today is catching God by surprise? There is nothing unprecedented about what's happening today when it comes to our God. Because he is the all-knowing one and he is the Alpha and Omega. And may that comfort you today as you ponder on that. So God knows exactly how this thing is going to turn out. He knows exactly what tomorrow holds, the day that follows, and even the years to follow. He knows. And so we, we know God's heart towards us. And it's not like he's hidden his heart away from us. We know that he loves us. Child of God, let that sink into your heart for a moment. He loves you. He is faithful. He is faithful towards you. He is a father to you. He is a good, good father. The word says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He may be silent at times, but he will never leave you nor forsake you. So what do we know about Job? Well, it's very easy to see in chapter one, in the very first verse, we can already see the, the, the person of Job. And the Bible describes Job as blameless, as upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Keep those Points, blameless, upright, one who feared God and shunned evil in the front of your mind as we carry on with this teaching into the book of Job. And so this brings me to point one of the message, and that is that God is interested in you as person. And so we read from Job 1, from verse 6 through to 12, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Interesting that in the courts of God, in the courts of the Lord, that Satan was there. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And then Satan says to God, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hand and his possessions have increased in the land. Basically saying that, well, he's a man after your own heart, God, but because you protect him and you've given him so much. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does, God fear, uh, does Job fear God for nothing? But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has 
and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Take note of that. Do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Did you notice two things as we were we're reading this portion of scripture? And that is regarding the character of Satan and his whereabouts. Well, we can see that he is working his evil on the earth. Secondly, we can see how Satan, as we see in Revelation 12 verse 10, that he is the accuser of the brethren. Did you also notice how Satan, in his arrogance, tries to trap God into doing evil? In verse 11, we see, But now you, as in God, stretch out your hand towards him, that being Job, and take all that he has. Satan is trying desperately in this, in this battle to entrap God into doing something which is completely against his nature. And in Job 2 verse 5 to 6, we see in a second uh, attempt and where Satan says, but stretch out your hand now, as in God, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you, God to your face. And for the second time, the Lord saw right through what Satan was doing, and he replied, he said, Behold, he, that is Job, is in your hand, but spare his life. And so we can learn a lot from this interaction between God and Satan. And the first thing is that God is not evil. God is is not evil. The second thing we see is God is sovereign and absolutely nothing happens without his knowledge or permission. We also see that God restricted Satan's activities to the things of Job, but the person of Job as his surrendered child, he was not to harm. And therein lies a message to all of us that there is nothing that the enemy can throw at the surrendered child of God that can separate you from the love of the Father. There is nothing the enemy can do that can separate you, child of God, from the love of the Father. And we see this in Romans 8 verse 34 to 39. It gets confirmed. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Child of God, nothing can separate you from the love of the Father. Point number two that we learn is that we should turn to worship in the midst of adversity. We see that after round one of Satan's hand at work in, in Job 1 from verse 20 to 22, this was Job's response when the first calamities hit him. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord 
In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. After round two of Satan's handed work, we read in Job 2 from verse 9 to 10. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. You know, it's been a very personal encouragement to me to see how in these times that we are living in right now, how people are creatively through social media, through video conferencing, through whatever means possible to be able to put worship right out there on any media platform that they can find. And regardless of the adversity that they might find themselves in, it is such a blessing to me to see how people are finding a way to worship the Lord in the midst of these troubles. And I want to just say to you that worship is the right response to what is going on right now. Worship is the child of God's response to what is happening to us right now. It shows a response that is after the heart of God. One that says that no matter what happens around me, what should fall to my right or to my left, I will worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We also see something else here is that we should not be distracted from worshiping our Lord, from engaging with Him, from continuing to get deeper and deeper into relationship with Him. And we see this in the context of Job's friends. And we see this in chapters 4 to 31, a compelling discourse between Job and his friends. And it consumes almost the entire book of Job. If you think that chapter 1 and 2 was almost like setting the stage, the whole book is consumed with these interactions between Job and his friends. And there's such a beautiful lesson for us in this. Child of God, I want to ask you a question today, and it's, it's a serious one to consider in, in my mind. What is your counsel at this time? Who is your counsel at this time? Is it maybe Facebook? Is it maybe Twitter? Is it maybe the news channels? You find yourselves at home and all you're doing is spending hours and hours on a device. Hours and hours consuming the news which is being broadcast around what we are going through. And I want to challenge you today that, and by this question, who is your counsel? Who is your friend, as it's put in the book of Job, at this particular time? You see, we need to be different. We must make sure that if we are to be found faithful through these adverse times, that if we are to come out of, at the end of this thing, Found faithful, we need to be found in the truth of God's word. We need to find ourselves closer to him than ever before. And isn't worship a beautiful way for us to draw near to our heavenly father? And so worship and the word is our very present help in time of need. And may I encourage you that worship is the right response to what we are going through. And that brings me to point number three, and that is that I, God, I am sovereign. You will notice in the book of Job that in chapters one and two, God features, and then it's, the whole book is consumed by this dialogue between Job and his friends. And here in chapter 38, towards the end, God comes back on the scene. And God makes no effort. He makes no 
attempt whatsoever to try to explain or defend himself towards Job. And rather, God goes through the series of questions towards Job. Questions which, as you read those texts, maybe you will look upon them as God asking you those questions. And so God goes through these series of questions with Job and then proceeds to answer them himself, showing without a shadow of any doubt that he, God, he is sovereign. And you know, at this time, there might be some who are questioning the sovereignty of God. Some might come into to doubt as to whether God is actually in control. And the enemy also certainly uses times like these to cement the argument in hearts that are already hardened, hearts that are not following after Jesus, hearts which are unsaved, that have not made a decision yet for Christ. And the enemy uses this opportunity to argue that there is no God. Is there really a God? Why is this happening? And if there is a God, maybe he is just unloving and unjust. Child of God, let me just say this. Never let this evil seed of doubt settle in your heart. Guard your heart and mind because this is not the truth. For our God, our God sent his only beloved son to seek and save the lost. It is our God who loves us with an everlasting love, counsels and comforts us by the Holy Spirit. That is the truth of our God according to the word and according to the power of the testimony of those who love him. So our responsibility to God is to obey him to trust him and to submit to his will, whether we understand it or not. Brings me to point number four, and that is that I, as in God, I will restore you. And so we see in the book of Job, after God expounds his sovereignty and and majesty to Job, what does Job do? Job does two things which I think is very important for us to take note of. And that is the first is he repents. And we see that in Job 1, from verse 1 to 6, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak, you said. I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes." The second thing that Job does is he forgives. And we see this in Job 42 from verse 7 to 9. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temite, My wrath is aroused against you and your friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take for yourself seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has." And so we see the three friends, they they go to Job and went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. And so we see Job's response 
to the revelation of the sovereignty of God, that God is answerable only to himself and is the almighty one, we see that Job does two things. He repents and he forgives his friends for all that had happened. And it's interesting for me that it's the very next verse in the book of Job where the Bible says, God restored. And we see this in Job 42 from verse 10 to 16. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers, all his sisters, and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters remembering that Job had lost all his children. So he also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima, second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. In all the land were found no woman as so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. And it ends by saying, so Job died old and full of days. I submit to you, child of God, that Job, through this test, through this ordeal, he was found faithful. And I trust the same for us as God's children, that we will be found faithful and that they may save us, that we were blameless, that we were upright, that we were ones who feared God and shunned evil. 